I don't know about you, but it doesn't really feel like there is a WWE pay-per-view on Sunday. And there is. It's called Stomping Grounds. It's brand new. For some reason, the tagline is kicking ass and taking names, which explains what Drew McIntyre was doing on Raw. But let's not get into that again. But man, I remember back in the day, we used to get so pumped for any kind of event that would fall on a Sunday evening. And now, it's just there. But we have had the go home show for all of that. And it was SmackDown. And it happened around about 14 hours ago. So to put it to bed, to draw a line under it, we've got to give the good bits an up. And we've got to give the bad bits a down. We do that using this. The finger of power. Even though sometimes the finger doesn't feature at all. Let's up those downs for Smack It Down. Smackdown really has suffered ever since the World Card Rule came into effect because not only is it the same every damn week, but it's basically a rerun of Raw. And why on earth would we do that when we used to have two interesting shows? Down. It kicked off with the New Day coming out and they were saying some things. Then Dolph Ziggler was out and he was saying some things as well. And there was nothing wrong with this, but you couldn't help but see the entire feud between Kofi Kingston and Dolph Ziggler for the WWE Championship has been built on opening promos like this. There's no meat and bones. Dolph thinks Kingston can't win without his buddies and Kofi disagrees. That's it. That's the whole thing. We're also going to get Ziggler versus Xavier Woods in this episode of SmackDown, and there really wasn't that much to take away from this. I'm kind of hoping that when we get through stomping grounds, that serves as a wake-up call not to run cards like this, but I'm not overly confident. And of course, before Dolph Ziggler had stopped talking, he said, it should have been me, it should have been me, it should have been me. It doesn't make any sense, Dolph. It doesn't make any sense. It shouldn't have been you because it wasn't you. And therefore, if it should have been you, it would have been you, but it isn't. Dolph Ziggler versus Xavier Woods was okay, though, even if, like the opening segment, it was just there, because something needs to be there, otherwise nothing exists. At one point, Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn ran down, and they were attacking Kofi Kingston and Big E, and then they all got thrown away from ringside, and eventually Dolph hit Xavier with the super kick, and he got the 1-2-3. At least the number one contender looked strong, eh? Give it up. We then got a big recap of Raw of everything that happened between Seth Rollins, his steel chair, and Baron Corbin. And then when we cut back to SmackDown, Shelton Benjamin and the B team were outside Baron Corbin's locker room. And straight away, you're allowed to ask, why the flub does Baron have a locker room on SmackDown? He's meant to be a Raw guy. It doesn't really matter though, because we gave a funeral to the brand split yesterday on Raw Ups and Downs. So now we can just start the mourning process. Mm. Axel and Bo spoke about how dangerous it was to even think about accepting the position as the special guest referee, but Selton Benjamin was a bit more wound up, a bit more angry about it, because he was all like, I understand what I'm getting into, but I'm going to use Baron Corbin for all his worth. I also think this was a bit of accidental continuity by WWE, because a few months ago, Shelton Benjamin was indeed attacking Seth Rollins on Raw at the request of Paul Heyman. Matt Hardy then popped out of the room and said, oh look, Senor Benjamin, which I enjoyed because it's an in-joke, but mostly this was utterly pointless and didn't really tie into anything, and therefore it gets a down. Right, I figured it out, everybody calm down. It was a moment of bliss next, and this time when she came out with Nikki Cross by her side, she wanted her coffee, and then Bailey, who was gonna be her guest, walked out and she had said coffee, and that's when it hit me like a light bulb, ding, above my head. The coffee is exclusive to SmackDown and is the last bastard of the brand split that actually gets any respect. So there you go, I understand now. I will only exclusively look for the coffee on SmackDown. Thanks, WWE. Also, once that was all out of the way, this was actually pretty good. Who would have thunk it? It can have an up. The two basically had a big argument about who was and who wasn't nice to them down in NXT. But this didn't sound scripted at all and in fact sounded like they were using real life experiences to further their feud. What a concept that is. And all of it felt very believable. Oh, can you believe it? There was also insinuations from Alexa that Bailey held herself in high regard because she used to go out there and try and get autographs from her heroes. And I tell you, you should actually go and watch this. And WWE should learn from it as well. And just make more segments that follow this template. Obviously, the two eventually got into a big fight, a big brawl. Nikki Cross got involved. And because she did, that allowed Alexa Bliss to get one last 
cheap shot in. And look, Nikki Cross looks a bit stupid in all of this because we can all see what's going on, but for some reason she can't. But all of a sudden, Bailey versus Alexa Bliss has become the best feud going into stomping grounds. Just like that. Chad Gable was then backstage again taking notes, and I don't understand any of this because it's really creepy. And in fact, everything that happened here was creepy because Lena Vega was like, you know, dolling herself up in the mirror. And then Apollo Crews like snuck up in a really odd way and was like, look, Zelina, I want a match with Andrade. That then allowed Andrade to attack Apollo Crews. And the whole time, Chad Gable kept taking notes. However, there's a little secret here, a little exclusive on ups and downs. I'm actually friends with Chad Gable. We used to wrestle in high school and I went out there. And I retrieved those notes. See, there you are, right there. That is what Chad Gable is talking about. We also got a promo with Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan who are now back to focusing on heavy machinery. And yes, you are allowed to think that is ridiculous because less than 24 hours ago, Daniel Bryan was involved in a completely different storyline and a completely different feud. But I tell you, that's just WWE in 2019. That's just what happens. We shrug our shoulders and the weight of our head because it's just so stressful means we slowly start coming down. But then we pull the rope and we come back up. Thankfully though, when we did get focusing on this promo specifically, which was Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan, who are gonna take on Heavy Machinery for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships at the pay-per-view, it was actually a lot of fun. Mostly, because Daniel Bryan was on commentary, and Daniel Bryan on commentary is like, I don't know, having sunshine on your wedding day. Give it up. At one point he was talking about the difference between the sheep herders and the bushwhackers, and that is such a nice reference, it blew my mind and I started to cheer in my chair like, yes, yes, Daniel Bryan is probably winding everybody up right now, talking about things they don't want him to talk about. And look, it was Heavy Machinery versus the B team, I can't remember if I said that. That's the match he was commentating on, and of course Heavy Machinery got the victory. How could you do anything else? When they had hit the compactor on Curtis Axel and Bo Dallas, however, from nowhere, Seth Rollins arrived and he was beating these two idiots up with a chair because of course they had been backstage earlier saying to Baron Corbin, we want to be the special guest referee. So for once, for the first time in around about 62,891 years, you got rewarded for watching Raw and you got a payoff on SmackDown. Now, I know that's not meant to happen because of the brand split, but again, the brand split is dead. I was all right with this. But then instantly we went the other way when Shane McMahon arrived into the arena. Now firstly, Shane, no, you were well late so somebody should reprimand you for that. But also when he was approached by Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn who were like, oh, Seth Rollins and Kofi Kingston are running amok. Shane McMahon made a tag team match between them for later on and it was a two out of three falls encounter. Why? Why? We did that on Raw and it didn't make any sense. So why are we taking that stipulation and just pasting it over SmackDown as well? Look, it's made my eye close and now I'm blind and I can no longer see. Open them, down. It's ridiculous because we could have done anything here. WWE is a story-based product. You could have done a normal tag team match. You could have done a couple of singles matches. Hell, you could have put Kevin Owens on a broom and let him fly around and call it a damn witch match for all I care. Just do you think I have a short-term memory of around about four seconds and I just can't remember this stuff? What was I talking about? <laughs> I'm joking. I was talking about the coffee. The two out of three falls match. Dumb. That then transitioned into Shane, Drew, and Elias coming to the ring because it can only be Elias on SmackDown even though on Raw it's the revival despite the fact that the Drifter was also on Raw this week. So that's mind blowing all of it itself. And then they just proceeded to go through everything that had happened on Raw. And then when The Miz arrived to take them to place for doing this, he showed everything that happened on Raw, but he showed it in slow motion and I took my hands like this and I thought maybe if I clench my fists hard enough my arms will just explode and I can worry about that for the day instead. Down. Miz even said at one point that Shane is using his power to take up too much television time. So WWE is perfectly aware of what they're doing and now as per usual they just want to throw it into our faces and we have to duck like this trying to get out the way. I don't know what to do anymore. Thankfully, the savior of all of WWE was close by and he was able to make this a lot better. Shane McMahon said to The Miz he's going to make a match and it's of course going to be Elias and Drew McIntyre taking on The Miz and a partner of his choosing, but he only has 10 seconds to find that partner. Then from Magic, our truth popped up from underneath the ring, which I suppose you were meant to think he'd been under since the end of Raw, because that's when we last saw him. Kind of made me laugh, because I'm that guy. The Miz went... You'll do our truth and although he tried to run away, he wasn't able to. That was your tag team match. I laughed. 
give it up. WWE did try to ruin it by making an elimination match, which was another stipulation that just pops up from the ground. And that doesn't make any sense. And of course, Truth was out of this rather quickly. He got kneed by Elias. One, two, three. And as soon as that was over with, all the usual people that want the 24-7 title ran down. Our truth ran away after some shenanigans with Shelton Benjamin, who just had a 180 storyline shift. I don't know what was going on there. But anyway, he's out of the picture. It was left to The Miz taking on the other two guys. And then back in the ring, Drew McIntyre just hit The Miz with a Claymore kick and beat him like he was a piece of cheese. So if you are keeping count, that is another loss for the A-lister ever since he turned face and everybody's wondering why this isn't working. Of course, afterwards, Shane McMahon picked The Miz back up, not once, but twice, so that Drew could kick him in the face a couple more times, and at no point did Roman Reigns come out to make the save. I mean, it's good for Drew. He now looks strong going into his match at Stomping Grounds, but none of it, none of it added up at all. That means I have to do it again, doesn't it? It means I have to do it again to try and get my point across. Roll it. A story by me. Simon Miller, a man, is walking down the road and he sees this giant mountain. He thought, that doesn't make any sense. I'm in a built-up city area. Why has a mountain appeared from nowhere? And the dog, he was looking down the hole and he found a million dollars and he thought, I'm going to be the richest dog of all time. To which Jennifer replied, well, I don't see it that way, Clive. And I can't believe you've been sleeping with Teresa. And then a rocket was flying through the sky and little Timmy thought, one day I'm going to grow up to be an astronaut. And then Mars just exploded. That's a WWE story, that is. That's a WWE story. You just take interesting tidbits, but nothing ever adds up or flows. Between all that, we also had the Authors of Pain coming out of Baron Corbin's dressing room. The Iconics are going to take on the Ibuki Warriors at some Japanese show that WWE's got going on. And Alistair Black cut another one of his please fight me promos. In this stage, I'll fight you, Alistair. If no one else is going to take the challenge, I'll take it. You can just whoop my ass. Ember Moon then beat up Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose, who were eating donuts. I just can't. Down. Also, when Ember was looking for these two and asked Carmella, have you seen Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? And she said no. Do you know where she found Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville? They were there. And I mean, literally, they were in front of her field of view. It's like this. Oh, look, there I go. And if someone then says, Simon, have you seen another version of you? And I go, no, oh, I didn't see them. They're allowed to go, well, you must be crazy. They were literally right in front of your face. Did enjoy the surprise with the 24-7 title, though, which hilariously goes to show how much I've actually invested myself in that. Give it up. Truth was trying to leave when he was blindsided by somebody that looked like Carmella, but as it turned out, it was actually Drake Maverick who had dressed up. He got the roll-up pin and he had his feet on a car to get that extra leverage. He won the championship, he got in that vehicle, and he drove off to his wedding. And of course, our truth being our truth wanted to know when Carmella had announced she was getting married, why he wasn't invited. And now we probably get to keep an eye on social media to see what's going to happen next with Drake Maverick is your new 24-7 champion. I'm all right with all of this. Long live our truth. Then, what did I tell you? What did I tell you yesterday, huh? On Raw Ups and Downs, which you can go back and watch right now if you haven't seen it. But we introduced the Sami Zayn tally board, and the tally board was there to mark every time he's in a match and takes a fall. Here we were having Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens taking on Kofi Kingston and Seth Rollins in the two or three falls match. And Sami Zayn took the first fall after a trouble in paradise in literally, not exaggerating here, five to eight seconds. Bring it down, tick it up, that's two. And look, this stupidness aside, this was a really fun match to watch because again, like I always say, the wrestlers in it are so talented. So as long as you take it within the context it was presented to you, you could have a good time. But otherwise, it would make you, again, just close your eyes because you couldn't believe what was going on. But hey-ho, that's not their fault. Give it up. Second fall came when Seth Rollins curb stomped Kevin Owens' face into the floor, which meant they won two to nothing. Why this had to be two out of three falls, I will never understand. Again, I'll be on my deathbed and I'll be about to die. My last words will be, why was that much? Two out of three falls. And then, like, I don't know, whoever's around my bedside will be like, Simon, have you been focusing on that all this time? And I'll be like, yes, I have. And they'll be like, you're an idiot. Then I'll die. Beep and I will have wasted my life. Heyman was also watching all of this from backstage to make you think that maybe Brock Lesnar is going to cash in. But of course, that is a pile of gibberish. Never going to happen. Which means there's nothing else in the way. Stomping Grounds is coming on Sunday. This did serve as the last show before then. And aside from a few highlights, that like the Alexa Bliss Bailey stuff was very well done. It just feels like Raw 1.5, and it did nothing to get me excited about that pay-per-view. It makes me really mad and really sad how much SmackDown has gone downhill over the last few months, and that's why 
We've got the overall spinny thing. On the Metatron right now, it's got to get it down. Now, don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you think about SmackDown. And if you agree with me, maybe you don't. I'd love to hear it. Like, share, and subscribe. Head over to whatculture.com, read yourself some articles. Follow what culture on Twitter, whatculture, WWE. And watch more videos here on What Culture Wrestling. My name is Simon from What Culture. Thank you very much for watching. And also, thank you to everybody who enjoyed my promo that I cut on Nathan Cruz yesterday. Again, you can go to watch that on Raw Ups and Downs. And to remind you that Ups and Downs match is coming at the end of the month. In Defiant Wrestling, I'm taking being a pro wrestler very seriously. Even though I understand I've got a long way to go, that doesn't mean I'm not going to kick ass now. I'll see you soon.